Hello and welcome to This Week in Review with Nigel Farage. Nigel, the stock market in the US absolutely tanked on Tuesday. It was the biggest crash since the pandemic. The S&P 500 down more than 4%, the Nasdaq about 5%. What do you make of it? Because it seems to be a, a huge reaction to a very small beat in the inflation figures. Yeah, but that's how markets work, isn't it? You know, they're often they often don't appear to be that rational. You know, remember it was a tiny little thing that brought down the Berlin Wall. So you know, the direct cause and effect is never what you think. But regular watchers of this podcast will know we've been warning about this for some considerable time. You know, we have thought there will be a stock market correction, and I think it'll go further over the course of this autumn or fall, as our American friends would call it, um, all of which is not to say you shouldn't be in good stocks and the right stocks, because we absolutely believe that you should. So I'm not particularly surprised by it. Um, and, you know, we're in turbulent economic times and no one yet knows exactly how this Ukrainian war is going to play out. If you believe what you're told, if you believe what you're told and that Putin's army has taken a real beating and a big step back and perhaps even as much as 3000 square kilometers of ground, has been taken back by Ukrainian forces. Well, why is that? I'll tell you why. It's the kit. It's the HIMARS. It's the javelins. It's the anti-tank weapons. It's all of those things. So if Putin starts to lose militarily, that means he might turn the screw even tighter on the West. And that's something no one's talking about, but I can see it clear as day. When I woke up on Wednesday and saw what happened to the US market, I thought, Everyone must have been making a big bet that the inflation figures would surprise on the downside and they'd all position themselves. And then when it was surprisingly high instead, everyone sort of panicked and sold out. But the following day, the stock market did not bounce back. It stayed down. You know, what uh, financial punters call a dead cat bounce didn't happen. Uh, and that suggests that it was a, a rational or, or a measured reaction to, I guess, the, the change in direction of inflation. So inflation started to rise again month over month, and perhaps that's what the panic is about. You know, how many times have we called it the disease of money? The disease of money caused by government, and it's always, always, always in the past been more difficult to get out of the system than anybody thinks. And maybe that's what we're seeing in America, and that dawning realisation that actually it is here to stay. That is the only big message I take from the stock market moves this week. Yeah, and the amount of tighter monetary policy that it will take to actually bring that inflation back down. Let's move on to Europe. Our winter is coming and the EU's making a mess of, of well, I, there's new policies coming out every day. Some of them don't make it, some of them do. It's all a bit bizarre. Are things getting any more clear to you about what's going to happen this winter? No, no, absolutely not. Um, uh, they are in a complete two and eight over the whole thing. Uh, you know, rationing is happening. The encouraging, I mean, basically, we're being encouraged to go back to the 1950s. That's really what it is. We're being encouraged to go back to the days before central heating. And I actually am just about old enough to remember growing up in a house that didn't have central heating, you know, or double glazing or any of those things. And we're going back to those days. You know, it's put on an extra jumper. Um, it's turn off all the lights, don't leave things on standby mode, don't go to the shops unnecessarily. I mean, that's what they're being, people are basically being told. We're, to, we're being told to go backwards in time because of our crescentless energy policy. Uh, and when it comes to the cost of energy, you know, you and I were discussing this a minute ago, marginal pricing. This is how the EU does its pricing. In simple English, what it means is that the wind and solar companies, in many cases already, taxpayer funded subsidized up to the gills, then get paid the price for their wind energy that is the equivalent of what the gas price costs. So here all this talk about putting super taxes on gas and oil companies, what about the renewables? They're the ones that have been legging us over for the last 20 years. Again, you can't talk about it uh, because if you do, you're a global warming denier of what could be worse, only witchcraft. But they have now proposed a windfall tax on the renewable sector, that part of the market, at least von der Leyen has. She's actually said that they're going to be included. Nuclear and I think wind and solar will be included in the, in the windfall tax, the super profits tax. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's totally surreal. Yeah, it's too late. They've had it off already. I mean, the whole thing is unbelievable. <laughs> but 
you know, I mean, who is this woman running the, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, she's not up to running my local primary school, let alone being in charge of you know, over 400 million citizens of the European Union. Um, they are all over the shop. They don't know what they're doing. The Italian election, which is coming up soon, is going to be a big test marker on this. Perfectly clear that the Brothers of Italy, the Lega, and perhaps Berlusconi too, don't think sanctions on Russia are working. In fact, they take the Hungarian view that it's better to do business with Russia. And that may well be what they do. And, and then, of course, the whole von der Leyen package is blown out of the water. And by the way, no one's noticed. But in Sweden, last Sunday, a set of elections, and there's a new centre-right coalition coming into government in Sweden, including the Swedish Democrats, who have been a pretty controversial right-wing party over their years. Europe is about to shift rightwards politically in a very big way. If you think 2016 with Brexit and Trump was a shock, I promise you this, you ain't seen nothing yet. And that will mean quite a big change in economic policies. It will mean countries actually say, you know what? This just-in-time supply chain leaves us very vulnerable. We need to build up national security, national reserves when it comes to energy. And I think food will be part of this equation too. And I suspect that in investment terms, over the next year or two, we need to get our heads around that big change that's coming. But do you think governments will get it right? I mean, the only thing worse than the EU's current energy policy and the energy market system is going to be the one that they're going to come up with next, right? Yeah, well, thank God we left the EU because they wanted us to join a common energy policy. I remember Nick Clegg waxing lyrical about being part of a common energy policy. Ours isn't great, but Liz Truss was beginning to turn it around last Wednesday when the piece of paper came into the House of Commons, you know, basically saying the Queen was in her last few hours. So all political debate since then in this country has stopped pretty much entirely. Uh, the worst of it is we then go, what, what, we, we then go into the party conference season. So Parliament isn't going to be back until the middle of October, which given where we are with everything, seems ridiculous. And I think these party conferences that Labour and the Conservatives are holding are frankly purely self-indulgent ways of making money at a time when the country needs real leadership. We, at least with trust, we're beginning to see something. Yeah, it does seem that there's a bit of a disconnect with the leadership, especially in the EU, but it sounds like also in our government. I know you're heading to Australia soon. Your bags must be packed. What are you going to tell the Aussies? Um, number one, don't follow us down the net zero route. You know, Scott Morrison went to, went to COP26 and came back with this net zero promise. Of course, everyone agrees, they always do, in Canberra and other sort of capital cities, and administrative cities. Um, net zero for Australia would be catastrophic. I mean, literally catastrophic because of their mining industry, et cetera. Um, you know, we've deindustrialized in the name of, of net zero. Um, I would urge Australians not to do the same thing. And it's funny, really, Anthony Albanese, the new Labour Prime Minister, He's proposing a referendum on something called the voice, which would give Aboriginal rights over other Australians. Um, well, if you're going to have a referendum on that, why not on the same day have a referendum on net zero? I think the result could be very interesting. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Um, well, I'm looking forward to, to having a, a listen to what you've got to say, Nigel. You'll be very welcome here, I'm sure. Or, uh, I'm not so sure, but either way, it'll be very enjoyable. Thanks for joining us on the video and everyone at home. Thanks for watching. Thank you.